thanks. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Um, welcome to Chai's HIV Access Program webinar, which is highlighting this year's HIV market report. My name is Jessica Fox, and I will be presenting today with my colleague, Amy Edmondo. And we're pleased to share with you Chai's 2022 HIV market overview, which covers key trends in the HIV space and forecasts of how we expect the market to evolve in the next five years. Throughout the presentation, feel free to type questions into the Q&A box, and we will address them as time allows. So I'll get us started today with a quick overview of our presentation. The structure of our market report and the bulk of today's presentation follows our HIV strategy of test smart, treat right, and stay negative. But I'll kick us off with a few slides on some general HIV market trends. Over the past few years, the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted daily life and impacted services across the cascade. Encouragingly, we have seen some rebounds in HIV programs over the past year, and we'll be highlighting these throughout the presentation. There are, however, some populations that remain disproportionately impacted. For example, pediatric outcomes, HIV outcomes, continue to lag behind adults. In 2021, only about half of children living with HIV were on ART, and there were almost 100,000 AIDS-related deaths among children, which is unacceptably high. Additionally, in a number of areas, there has been stagnating progress, including new HIV infections, ART initiations, and AIDS-related deaths. And finally, further threatening continued progress, new epidemic threats, such as MPOX and recent polio outbreaks, point to the potential for future disease-related disruptions. In order to overcome these ongoing disruptions, the global community must remain vigilant to prevent further setbacks to HIV progress. And this is particularly clear when we look at the global fast track targets highlighted on the right side of the slide. There are still significant gaps in progress toward achieving 95% of people who know their status, 95% of those who know their status on ART, and 95% of those on ART achieving viral suppression. Achieving these targets by 2025 will require significant effort. And in addition to these COVID disruptions, people living with HIV also remain at increased risk of COVID-19, as we've seen in a number of studies that we've highlighted on this slide. And while the WHO recommends prioritization of people living with HIV for the COVID-19 vaccine, access has been unequal across the globe. Data from July of this year, highlighted on the right side of the slide, shows that only 21% of Africa's population had completed their primary series of COVID vaccines, lagging behind much of the rest of the world. In addition to COVID vaccines, access to COVID treatment is also critical for high-risk patients. And following US FDA emergency youth use authorization for Pfizer's Paxlovid, Chai and partners worked to broker an agreement in May of 2022 to make generic Paxlovid available for less than 25 US dollars per treatment course for high-risk patients. Ensuring this treatment is available in addition to vaccines will be critical to preventing deaths and continuing progress toward the HIV program targets that we discussed on the previous slide. And an enabler to this continued progress is the recent confirmation of Dr. Jong Nakengasan as the US Global AIDS Coordinator, which includes leadership of PEPFAR. Dr. Nakengasan is a Cameroonian virologist with more than 30 years of experience, and he's the first person born on the African continent to lead PEPFAR. He set a number of priorities for future success and has also emphasized the importance of leveraging regional experience and expertise. This experience, as well as his vast experience, sets the stage for continued progress, even in light of ongoing pandemic challenges. Now, as HIV programs continue to evolve, there's also been a shift to increase emphasis on other aspects of health, and in particular, mental health. Now, despite the importance and prevalence of common mental disorders, access to screening or treatment for mental health is limited in most LMICs. For example, as we've highlighted on the left side of the slide, a study presented on AIDS 2022, which is based on data from HIV clinics across 41 countries, found serious gaps in the availability of screening and treatment for depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. This is also reflected in a mental health needs assessment for people living with HIV that was conducted in Zimbabwe in collaboration with CHAI, which is highlighted on the right side of the slide. This first of its kind assessment identified several barriers to mental health care in Zimbabwe, as well as enabling factors that could facilitate improvements. And the results from the study will be critical to keep in mind as many countries continue to incorporate mental health into HIV care. So turning next to market trends, the HIV market is robust and continues to grow in parallel with significant price reductions, but continued investment and focus are needed to sustain program gains. 
In 2021, in generic accessible LMICs, which we define as countries where generic manufacturers supply most of the ARVs, we estimate that the ARV market size in GA LMICs was 1.8 billion US dollars. And this market has stayed relatively stable since 2017. And this is in part due to the fact that more people living with HIV are being put on treatment in tandem with decreasing prices. And we've highlighted some of these major price reductions in the table on the bottom left. So for treatment, the per patient per year cost of the WHO preferred adult treatment, TLD, is now below 50 US dollars a year, an exciting and significant achievement. For testing through a Chai and MedAccess pricing deal, an HIV self-test is now available at a cost of one US dollar, which brings it closer to parity with RDTs, expanding opportunities for use. These reductions in price represent significant achievements, but continued investment in the HIV response will be critical to sustain current successes. So as you can see in the graph on the right, total HIV resources and LMICs are far below the approximately 8 billion in additional total funds that UNAIDS estimates will be required by 2025 to meet HIV elimination goals. This additional and continued resourcing will play a critical role in sustaining and expanding access to HIV services. I'll now move on to the next section, Test Smart, where I'll outline major HIV diagnostic trends. And we'll start this section with an overview of where we currently are. And unfortunately, diagnosis remains the largest gap among the UNAIDS 95, 95, 95 targets, with only 85% of people living with HIV aware of their status. Testing was also significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic with fewer tests conducted in Eastern and Southern Africa in both 2020 and 2021 compared to 2019. Compounding these COVID disruptions, PEPFAR's HIV testing guidance since 2019 has emphasized more targeted testing for those at the highest risk of acquiring HIV. Due to the strategy, total HIV tests in 41 PEPFAR countries decreased from 20 million in 2018 to 15 million in 2021. Now, within this data set, the proportion of positive test results has remained at about 4%. However, it does mean that fewer people living with HIV are accessing testing and aware of their status. Now, as countries consider new testing strategies and these declining test volumes, it's also important to call out the non-linear pathways that individuals may take when accessing care. And this is highlighted in two recent studies on the right side of this slide. The first in Zambia found that 24% of newly identified HIV positive clients had suppressed viral loads, which suggests that many are already or were recently on ART. A similar study in Uganda, highlighted in green, found that among individuals enrolled at one ART center, 35% sought repeat testing for various reasons. So many people living with HIV will continue to cycle in and out of care through the so-called revolving door of care, and this should be taken into account when setting testing targets and strategies. HIV self-testing also represents an opportunity to improve rates of HIV diagnosis, and there have been some exciting developments in the space in the last year. In July of 2022, Chai, MedAxis, and Wanfo Biotech Company announced a historic pricing agreement for Wanfo's new HIV self-test, which is now available for one US dollar for public sector purchasers in 140 lower and middle income countries. As I mentioned in the general trend section, this now brings the cost closer to parity with conventional HIV rapid diagnostic tests, which may allow for expanded use. Also in April 2022, Abbott's Check Now HIV self-test received WHO pre-qualification and is now available for 150 US dollars X-Works per test for public sector purchasers. The addition of these two tests means that there are now six HIV self-tests with WHO pre-qualification several of which are available at a price below two US dollars. There are also several new HIV self-tests currently under development. And the first is a new oral fluid self-test, which is expected to be approved in early 2023. And then there are additional blood-based HIV self-tests expected in the next 12 to 18 months. Additionally, these new tests are also expected to cost two US dollars or less. Now, in parallel to these improvements in supply, research on HIV self-testing has also demonstrated high rates of linkage to care and identified some additional areas for use. So given that HIV self-testing may occur outside of a facility, traditionally, a major area of focus for research has been how well people are then linked to services. And a couple studies looking at this are highlighted on the left side of the slide. So starting at the top in four or five star program studies, 
community-based HIV self-test distribution led to an overall increase in ART initiations in Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, suggesting that people who take self-tests do link to care and treatment. Similarly, in two systematic reviews and meta-analyses, HIV self-testing increased uptake of testing among general and key populations and achieved linkage rates similar to standard HIV testing. Now, in addition to these positive results on linkage to care, a Kenyan implementation study also looked at the applications of self-tests for oral PrEP users. And the study found that utilizing interim HIV self-testing reduced the overall number of clinic visits without compromising testing, retention, or adherence. This suggests that HIV self-testing can play an important role in prevention services. And building on this idea, a new WHO technical brief on oral PrEP delivery highlights the potential applications of HIV self-testing for prevention services. So now let's turn to early infant diagnosis, or EID. And as we discussed in the general trend session, this is one of the places where we're seeing COVID rebounds after initial disruptions in 2020. In 2021, we estimate that there were approximately 1.9 million EID tests run, which is an increase of over 30% compared to 2020. And while this increase is encouraging, we estimate that overall EID testing coverage in LMICs is still only 62%, so there's still significant work to be done. Now, even once diagnosed, there are still significant gaps with result utilization and management, meaning that many children are not appropriately linked to care. For example, a Zambian study compared improved result return in an existing dried blood spot based system to point of care or POC. However, very concerningly, in both the POC and standard of care arms, only 19 to 30% of HIV positive infants were alive, in care, and suppressed at 12 months. This means that there remain critical gaps in linkage and retention and care for HIV positive infants, which need to be urgently addressed. And in addition to identification of HIV positive infants, diagnosing congenital syphilis is also key to eliminating infant deaths. So globally, there are more than 200,000 stillbirths or newborn deaths, which are caused by congenital syphilis per year. And these deaths are preventable if the mother is tested and treated in time. While in many countries, up to 95% of women are tested for HIV during antenatal care, less than 50% are tested for syphilis. So to address this gap, a pricing agreement for an HIV syphilis combo test was announced in November of 2021, making this dual test less than one US dollars X-Works in 139 countries. And this pricing agreement is a key opportunity to integrate dual HIV syphilis tests into existing antenatal care pathways and could allow programs to close the testing gap between HIV and syphilis. And then finally, to close out this section, this slide looks at new research that suggests aging populations should be a focus for testing initiatives looking forward. So as you can see on the graph on the left, the study found that across geographies, between 8 to 24% of people diagnosed with HIV were over 50 years old. And on top of this, a low CD4 count of below 350 cells per milliliter occurred at a higher rate among older people, suggesting that older people were presenting to care with more advanced stages of HIV. Moving forward, we need to ensure that older populations are not being left behind, and new testing strategies for specific populations, including older people, will be really critical to reach and identify the remaining people living with HIV. So I'll now hand it over to Amy, who's going to present the Treat Right sections. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so I'll start off the Treat Right section by discussing um, Treat Right by addressing advanced HIV disease, or AHD. Next slide. So we've seen significant progress in HIV treatment in recent years. However, when we look at AIDS-related deaths, the progress is still too slow. As you can see in the graph on the left in blue, there were 650,000 AIDS-related deaths in 2021, a 6% rate of decline since 2018. This is too slow to reach UNA's targets by 2025, which requires a decline of 21% per year, represented in green. While significant gains have been made in ART coverage among adults in GLMICs, treatment coverage remains low for children. On the top right side of the slide, you can see that only 52% of children are in ART as compared to 76% of adults. Because ART coverage in children remains low, as a result, AIDS-related mortality is disproportionately high. To address AIDS-related deaths in children, national programs need to identify, link, and retain children in care while scaling interventions. Next slide. 
The gateway to this AHD package of care is CD4 testing, which indicates if a client has AHD. Visitech, a device-free same-day CD4 test, provides results at a cost of $3.98 XWorks per test and over 130 LMICs. In 2020, Chai and Unitaid initiated the early market access vehicle to expand access to Visitech and catalyze early interest. Through this work, over 44 countries, which are displayed in the map on the right side of this slide, have ordered over 480,000 tests as of October of 2022. Adoption is ongoing and further rollout could help to significantly improve same-day identification of AHD and linkage to care. Next slide, thanks. After AHD cases have been identified, diagnosis and treatment of opportunistic infections is critical to eliminating AIDS-related deaths. TB is the most common opportun opportunistic infection among people living with HIV, accounting for one in three AIDS-related deaths. For the first time in over a decade, in 2020, TB deaths among PLHIV increased and ART coverage among PLHIV with incident TB decreased. Now this is likely due to COVID-related disruptions. Children also remained a focal population for TB control, with children under 15 years representing 11% of all people with TB globally. To this end, the WHO released a number of guideline updates to improve access to and quality of TB care. These include updates to guidelines on the management of TB in children and adolescents, which are summarized in this blue graphic in the center of the slide, guidance on TB screening, and recommendations for shorter treatment regimens. Next slide. For those with AHD who have not yet contracted TB, preventative therapy is essential for preventing a future infection. Rifapentine, which is a key drug in TB preventative therapy, continues to scale up following the easing of supply challenges experienced over the last few years. As you can see on the left side of the slide, in terms of suppliers, the Global Fund's expert review panel recommended Lupin's isoniazid rifapentine fixed dose combination tablets and rifapentine 300 milligram single tablets until May of 2023. In addition to this new supplier, McLeod's continues to increase production capacity for their fixed dose combination tablets. To improve access even further, Unitaid, the Orem Institute, Chai, and MedAccess announced two new agreements in August of 2022 to lower the price of these rifapentine based, based formulations. Um, and these are um, agreements that are eligible in 138 low and middle income countries. And through these agreements, the fixed dose tablets will now be available at a ceiling price of $14.25 excerpts per treatment regimen from both McLeod's and Lupin. And rifapentine 300 milligram single tablets will be available from Lupin for $33.90 excerpts per 100 tablets. Note that these supply improvements must be paired with approaches for reaching people with HIV with this critical medicine. Next slide, thanks. Another opportunistic infection among, common among people with AHD is cryptococcal meningitis, which is responsible for nearly one-fifth of AIDS-related deaths. In July, the WHO released updated guidelines for diagnosing, preventing, and managing cryptococcal disease in people living with HIV. These new guidelines strongly recommend a single high dose of liposomal amphotericin B as part of the preferred induction regimen for the treatment of crypto cryptococcal meningitis which is supported by results from the Ambition CM trial. Further, this new regimen offers a number of client and provider benefits, which we can see in the center, including lower toxicity and fewer monitoring demands. In addition to these benefits, a modeling analysis found that despite increased treatment costs, liposomal amphotericin B is cost-effective compared to the standard of care due to decreased mortality risk, a potential for less hospitalization time. Next slide. Adoption of liposomal amphotericin B, as well as flucytosine, which is another key drug used in induction treatment, is ongoing as countries begin to roll out WHO's AHD package of care. In terms of supply updates for liposomal amphotericin B, in December of 2021, Sun Pharma received approval, making them the first generic supplier. They're working to develop an LMIC pricing and access strategy. For flucytosine, Viatris received approval for a new API source in July of 2022. WHO also approved an extension of the shelf life of Viatris' flucytosine product. And lastly, Strides commercialized flucytosine for LMICs and has started to supply the product. 
Finally, on the right side of the slide, we've highlighted procurement of these medicines. With placed orders for liposomal amputarsin B in blue, orders for fusidocine in yellow, and orders for both products in green. In the circular graphics on the right, you can see the significant demand for these products via 2021 order volumes. So now, with, now that we've covered AHD, I'm gonna discuss adult treatment optimization. So starting with global HIV statistics on the left, there were 36.7 million adults living with HIV in 2021. Of these, 76% were on ART. And in the graph on the right, we see that in generic accessible LMICs, there were about 23 million adults on ART in 2021. This is represented by the navy blue bars. Adult ART coverage in GA LMICs in 2021, which is indicated by the green line, was similar to global rates of 77%, representing just a two percentage point increase from 2020. This slowing growth rate is expected given expanded ART coverage and increasing difficulty identifying the remaining undiagnosed people living with HIV. Moving forward, addressing regional and population specific gaps in access to HIV treatment will be increasingly important. On the topic of optimal adult treatment, we're finding that traditional lines of therapy are beginning to change with the introduction of DTG and Dronavir Ritonavir. So looking at the graphic on the left, Prior to the introduction of DTG in 2017, lines of therapy had historically been defined by the drug classes that were used with clients progressing through first, second, and third line after experiencing treatment failure. And on the bottom of this graphic, as I mentioned, this new paradigm sees DTG and PIs used across lines of therapy. As programs continue to roll out DTG and Dronavir and with new ARVs on the horizon, the global community needs to revisit this traditional structure to ensure that it is indeed fit for purpose. Classifying clients based on prior exposure, such as NC or PI exposed, might be a more relevant way to understand cohorts of people on ART. Now moving to the graph on the right, we see over 80% of first and second line regimens and generic accessible LMICs now include DTG. We expect this to increase and begin to stabilize around 88% in 2023. There might also be a slight rise in the use of PIs as some clients begin to experience treatment failure on DTG. Next slide. This shift in lines of therapy has implications for client sequencing and m and &E systems. Current data systems in many countries cannot differentiate between DTG use in first and second line with many second line clients now incorrectly reclassified as first line following a transition from PIs to DTG. Additionally, systems are often unable to distinguish between pediatric and adult formulations of DTG, which can be hard to estimate in the absence of weight band data. Because of this inability to differentiate, monitoring second line optimization of DTG is truly challenging. Moving to the graph on the right side of the slide, a chai analysis based on historic second line trends estimates, sorry, estimates that there were approximately 500,000 clients on DTG and second line in GA LMICs in 2021. However, approximately um, 100,000 of these were likely reclassified to first line when transitioning to DTG. To speak a little bit more about this second line optimization, results from two trials in Sub-Saharan Africa, Fizend and Nadia, continue to demonstrate that tenofovir and lamivudine backbones can be recycled in second line. While WHO guidelines have not been updated yet, some countries have already started recycling tenofovir in second line. In the bottom right, CHI modeling shows that widespread adoption of TDF recycling would have a dramatic impact on AZT use and GA LMICs which already accounts for a relatively small proportion of NRTI use. However, it is critical to ensure uninterrupted supply of AZT for people who might not tolerate TDF. Next slide, thanks. One of the most exciting updates in the adult treatment space is the approval and introduction of the protease inhibitor during in the 450 milligram fixed dose combination formulation. This is a long awaited optimal product for use in second line. On the left, we've outlined some of the key benefits of drenavir These include a high genetic barrier to resistance and improved viral suppression as compared to lipinavir It's also slightly cheaper than lipinavir And this is thanks to a CHI and Unitaid incentive program 
where genetic drinivirotonivir from hetero labs is WHO pre-qualified and available for $17.50 per pack XWorks. Moving on to some barriers to broader adoption, to date, uptake has been limited given the WHO still lists drinivirotonivir as an alternative second line regimen. Additionally, PEPFAR is unable to procure heteros drinivirotonivir product because it does not have US FDA tentative approval. Looking at the drinivir ritonavir adoption map on the right-hand side of this slide, a handful of countries have placed order, orders for this generic product. In July of 2022, Nigeria and Zambia started introducing drinivir ritonavir for clients experiencing DTG-based treatment failure or intolerance via a Unitaid-funded catalytic procurement. Now, we hope to use the data and lessons learned from this introduction to support broader rollout. And you can read more about this introduction on Chai's blog by scanning this QR code. Delving a little bit deeper into some of these barriers from the last slide, Chai modeled several scenarios exploring potential uptake of drinivir tonavir. Just note that this analysis excludes South Africa due to tender cycles. Looking at the graph on the left, if we continue with the status quo, drinivir ritonavir uptake as a percentage of lapinavir ritonavir will remain relatively limited as represented in light blue. WHO recognition of drinivir ritonavir as the preferred PI would likely motivate national programs to adopt and roll out drinivir ritonavir, leading to slightly more uptake represented in dark blue. This would also be in alignment with the desires of people living with HIV as indicated in the community position statement from last year. And now in green, if drinivir ritonavir were also to receive US FDA appro tentative approval, it would likely result in the highest uptake as that would enable PEPFAR to procure the product. Note that PEPFAR's 2022 COP guidance already lists drinivir ritonavir as a preferred PI following failure or intolerance to TLD. To support programs considering drinivir ritonavir introduction for use in second line treatment, we encourage staff and partners to explore resources on the HIV New Product Introduction Toolkit website. And we've listed a couple of those resources here. Next slide, thanks. In the last few slides of this section, I'm gonna discuss the pipeline for adult ARVs, starting with the recent updates from the fourth WHO convened conference on ARV drug optimization or CATO-4. In the CATO-4 priority and watch list update, we see a shift in HIV treatment and prevention priorities from daily oral pills to longer acting products and novel delivery methods. To better understand country readiness to introduce these long acting treatments, CHAI in partnership with the Ministries of Health in Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa conducted a long acting, uh, sorry, a landscape assessment of this readiness. And you can see these um, findings summarized in the green graphic on the bottom of this slide. And CHAI plans to share these findings more broadly in the near future. These new products have the potential to significantly improve clinical outcomes with expected improvements in user acceptability, adherence, and viral suppression. However, the introduction of long-acting products will require new approaches to HIV service delivery to realize their full potential. And lastly, volunteer, voluntary licensing is a critical enabler to broad access to these products and LMICs. And at the time of publication, neither lenacapavir nor slashivir had been licensed with a medicines patent pool. So digging in a little bit more into this pipeline, I'm gonna go over some ARVs that are on the horizon, which you can see outlined by stage of development in the graphic on the left. The first product on our agenda is Vive and Janssen's injectable ART, cabotegravir and ropivirine, which is approved as a monthly injection in January of 2021. This was updated to every eight weeks in February and the label was expanded again in March to include the treatment of virologically suppressed people living with HIV age 12 and above and 35 kilograms or more, and oral lead-ins were made optional. This is not an optimal product in LMICs for a variety of reasons, and demonstration projects will be critical to understand the implementation of this product in LMIC settings. Lenacapavir is Gilead's first-in-class capsid inhibitor with potential uses in both HIV prevention and treatment as a long-acting product. In June of 2021, Gilead submitted a new drug application with the US FDA for lenacapavir, but in December of 2021, the US FDA placed a clinical hold on this product due to compatibility issues between lenacapavir and the vials in which it was packaged. Gilead submitted data to support use of a different vial and the US FDA lifted this clinical hold in May and allowed research activities to continue. 
With the hold lifted, Gilead resumed, uh, sorry, resubmitted their application to the USFDA in June, and a decision is expected by the end of this year. Um, and note that this was actually approved for use in the EU um, uh, with an optimized background regimen for treatment in multi-drug resistant HIV. Lastly, Islachivir is Merck's first-in-class nucleoside reverse transcription translocation inhibitor. And this product has unfortunately been plagued by setbacks. Despite positive data from the Illuminate Switch AMB trial showing that Eslachivir and Duravarine produced a viral response comparable to existing ART and virally suppressed people living with HIV, the US FDA placed a partial clinical hold on Eslachivir in December of 2021 based on decreases in total lymphocyte and CD4 T cell counts in some trial participants. This hold applied to all clinical trials studying Islachivir for prevention and treatment. In September of 2022, Merck announced phase two and phase three studies using a lower dose of Islachivir. And as a result of everything that has happened in the past couple of years, the future of Islachivir in the long acting treatment space remains uncertain. Note that because both Islachivir and Lenacapavir are also being studied for prevention, we'll touch on these a bit more in the prevention section also. Now with the recent approvals of long-acting injectable ART, the world now has a new way to treat HIV aside from daily oral pills, and user choice will become increasingly important. Chai conducted a literature review to understand the existing body of evidence related to HIV service delivery and product preferences among people living with HIV and LMICs. The review found very few studies looking at preferences for product formulations. Of those studies, a few of the findings are outlined on the left side of this slide. Notably, the ATLAS 2M trial found 94% of people living with HIV with experience taking both daily oral and injectable ARVs expressed a preference for bimonthly injectable ART as compared to daily oral pills. There is recognition within the HIV space that additional research on end user preferences and LMICs is needed, and communities of people living with HIV have voiced their desire to be involved in that research. Now I'll spend this next section discussing trends in the pediatric HIV, in pediatric HIV treatment from this past year. In 2021, the number of children on the ART declined for the second year in a row, with only 880,000 of the 1.7 million children living with HIV on life-saving treatment, representing only a 52% coverage rate. With suboptimal coverage and low viral suppression, children are disproportionately affected accounting for 15% of AIDS-related deaths, despite making up only 4% of all people living with HIV, as you can see in the charts on the bottom left. If you look at the graph on the right, we see a gradual decline in pediatric case finding when we look at the dark blue bars, which represents the number of children on ART. However, with only a 5% year-over-year increase in the number of children on ART, represented by the lighter blue bars and the green line, coverage could reach nearly 100% within a few years indicating that with a concerted focus, we could reverse these trends. Turning to updates in HIV treatment for children, we'll discuss dolutegravir 10 milligrams dispersible and squared tablets or pediatric DTG, where we've seen rapid and widespread adoption of this optimal product. As of Q3 of 2022, over 100,000 children have transitioned to PSDTG in more than 60 countries, as you can see in the map on the left side of the slide. South Africa is also preparing to transition children to this optimal product. In June, the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority approved PDCTG. And in November, the National Department of Health announced a buyout mechanism for PDCTG while waiting for a supplementary tender in 2023. Given this information, we anticipate rollout of PDCTG in South Africa in early 2023. With this rapid uptake of PEDS DTG, we see that the pediatric market share of DTG has doubled between 2020 and 2021. When we look at historical regimen splits, we estimate that about 36% of children on pediatric treatment backbones were on DTG-based regimens in 2021. However, pre-transition viral load testing requirements in some countries have slowed the transition of, to this optimal product and left some children on suboptimal therapies. WHO guidelines have consistently emphasized that viral load monitoring remains a good practice, but should not be considered for, for a, a precondition for transition to PSDTG. 
In countries that do not require viral load testing to transition to PCTG, we have seen an incredibly rapid scale up as highlighted on the right side of the screen. Moving forward, we anticipate DTG will dominate pediatric treatment with lopinavir tonavir based regimens used only for the minority of children who are unable to tolerate DTG. Looking ahead, the fifth pediatric ARV drug, drug optimization meeting list or the PATO-5 list outlines updated priorities for pediatric HIV treatment and postnatal prophylaxis. Like the CATO-4 list, many of the pediatric watch list products are long-acting therapies. However, several priority list products are in advanced stages of development. So starting on the left-hand side of the slide, we have fixed dose pediatric ABC, 3DC, DTG, or PALD, sorry, pediatric ALD. This is the WHO recommended first line regimen for children living with HIV in one convenient pill. In March of this year, the US FDA granted tentative approval for V's dispersible pediatric ALD for 10 to 25 kilograms. In late of 2022, V's plans, sorry, in late 2022, VEATH plans to file to expand this eligibility down to six kilograms. And in early 2023, we anticipate generic manufacturers Orobindo and Viatris are planning to file for US FDA tentative approval. And by mid-2023, we expect that this tentative approval will be granted. Countries should begin planning for pediatric ALD introduction. However, programs should not wait for the triple fix dose combination and should continue to transition children children living with HIV onto the PCTG 10 milligram singles. Moving to the center, pediatric durinavir ritonavir is the best in class PI with likely use among children who fail DTG based therapies. Historical barriers to, to development of this product have included high API costs and low volumes. Um, Chai is working with Loris Labs to develop pediatric durinavir ritonavir via an incentive program as part of the universal project. And lastly, we have pediatric TAF, which is, has potential use as a backbone NRTI in pediatric patients who can't tolerate TDF or perhaps need an alternative to ABC. Penta is currently conducting pharmacokinetic modeling and bioavailability studies, and CHAI is supporting as the formulation development partner. And while introducing optimal treatment products is a key component of improving care quality, and ensuring viral suppression, country programs must also have systems in place to support correct product use. In particular, understanding a country's pediatric weight band distribution is critical to accurately quantifying ARV needs, ensuring that facilities are prescribing age and weight appropriate ARVs to children, and to design effective interventions that address gaps in care. The CHI supported faster product, product sorry, project worked with ministries of health in Nigeria, Tanzania, and U Uganda and Zambia to develop, introduce job aids, tools, and revised monitoring and evaluation processes to better document weight. Um, they built and strengthened quality of care dashboards to aggregate weight-based weight -based ART data. And they customized national action plans and toolkits to help address case finding, linkage, and health worker capacity. So looking at the graph in the middle of this slide, optimal ART uptake at 245 faster priority facilities increased across all weight bands from baseline to end line. Customized packages of care like those provided by the FASTER project address specific country gaps and services to ensure optimal ART uptake and the best possible outcomes for children. I'll now close out this section with treat right with appropriate monitoring. As Jessica mentioned earlier in this presentation, COVID-19 impacted HIV services across the cascade and viral load testing volumes were very much a part of this. As you can see in the graph on the left, viral load testing volumes in LMICs remained relatively flat, hovering around 21 million tests per year in 2019 and 2020. In 2021, viral load volumes rebounded significantly with nearly 24 million tests conducted for a coverage rate of 75%. Looking forward, we anticipate increasing demand for conventional and point of care viral load testing, reaching nearly 34 million tests in 2026. In addition to testing, it's important for clients to receive their tests and for clinical action to be taken based on these results. In a CHAI supported study in Zimbabwe, pregnant women tested on near point of care viral load platforms at the facility were four times more likely to receive the result and eight times more likely to receive clinical follow up action within 30 days of testing. 
However, conversely, a recent meta-analysis of people living with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa found that clients with an average of 17 months between confirmation of neurologic failure on first line and a subsequent switch to second line treatment. Further, their pulled mean CD4 counts were often below 200 at this point. It's clear that we not only need to increase access to viral load testing, but a concerted effort is needed to ensure that clients actually receive their test results and appropriate clinical action is taken. Moving on to CD4 testing volumes and forecasted volumes, as I mentioned earlier in the AHD section, CD4 testing remains a critical gateway to advanced HIV disease package of care. We estimate that 12.5 million device-based CD4 tests were conducted in 2021, an increase compared to 2020, bringing volumes closer to pre-COVID levels. Viral load still remains the standard for treatment monitoring, though CD4 testing is still needed to access AHD care. For this reason, we see a leveling of CD4 tests into the future. Next slide. And finally, to close out this section, we're gonna to touch on surveillance systems for drug resistance testing. Reassuring results from the 2021 WHO pretreatment drug resistance survey and a Malawi resistance study indicate that there is relatively low DTG resistance. Although treatment failure and DT related mu mutations appear to be rare, programs should consider drug resistance testing in select cases of treatment failure. And now when we focus on pediatrics, this is slightly more concerning. This found that pediatric um, pretreatment, sorry, pretreatment of back of ear resistance ranged from 1.5% to nearly 20%. These findings highlight the importance of quickly transitioning children to DTG-based regimens and supporting uh, the development of pediatric TAF as an alternative option to abacavir for infants and children. And lastly, in August of 2022, Thermo Fisher announced a $40 experts price point for drug resistance test um, genotyping kits for Sanger sequencing machines. This is comprised of a $20 Xworks assay and a $20 expert and $20 Xworks for reagents, sample prep, and consumables to conduct this test. And this price point could help expand access to drug resistance testing in low and middle income countries. I'll now hand it back to Jessica to wrap up this presentation with a discussion on trends in the HIV prevention space. Great. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, so as she said, I'll review some prevention highlights in this next section. And as we see here, there have been some concerning trends in the prevention space and progress toward reducing HIV infections is under threat. In 2021, new infections remain stagnant at 1.5 million, which is the smallest annual decline since 2016. There were also 38 countries with increases in HIV infections since 2015, which is an extremely worrying trend. Even in regions where infections are decreasing, there's also significant variance across countries, as we've highlighted in the graph on the right. So looking first at the blue graph on top, although infections in the East and Southern Africa region as a whole are decreasing, in Uganda, there were 4% more new infections in 2020 compared to 2021. And in Kenya, there was no change in new infections. This indicates that there's still a lot of work to be done in decreasing new HIV infections in a number of countries. Additionally, as we've highlighted at the bottom, key populations continue to be at increased risk of HIV across the board. So as we look forward and think about how to reverse some of the worrying trends we just discussed on the previous slide, there are some exciting developments in the prevention space. Cabotegravir long-acting or cab -A, is a long-acting injectable that has the potential to make a drastic impact in the prevention space. It's administered every eight weeks after the first two doses, which are given four weeks apart. And it's the first long-acting injectable HIV prevention product on the market. We received US FDA approval for cab -LA in December of 2021. And following this approval, community advocates released a statement demanding generic licensing, part of which is shown at the bottom of the slide. However, in March of 2022, we released an initial statement saying they would not pursue volunteering licensing. And following this announcement, community advocates held a forum to discuss cab -LA access and priorities. And shortly after, in July of 2022, we've granted a voluntary license. The strong community advocacy over this period played a pivotal role in this licensing and ensuring future access for this critical product. Currently, generic planning is ongoing and countries are beginning to plan for product introductions. However, while generic development progresses, Vive will be the sole supplier of cab -LA. 
And the price they set for Cabalet during this period will in part be dependent on commitments and investments from large donors, but it will significantly influence equitable access in the next several years. Looking ahead, there are still a number of steps required in order to prepare for the introduction of Cabalet. And as part of this preparation, the WHO released new prevention guidelines in July of 2022, which recommend Cabalet as an additional HIV prevention option for people at substantial risk of HIV infection. Um, there's also a lot of ongoing research and implementation studies that will inform future product adoption. And we've highlighted a few of these studies on the bottom right of this slide. Um, currently studies are planned by Unitaid, PEPFAR, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And these will provide essential information for future adoption. Turning next to the elimination of vertical HIV transmission, both an exciting success story, as well as a reminder that there's a lot of work to be done. Despite the availability of tools and technology for the prevention of H vertical transmission of HIV, only 15 countries globally have eliminated vertical transmission. Encouragingly, Botswana became the first high burden country to achieve a vertical transmission rate of less than 5% and reach the WHO's silver tier status for HIV elimination. And there are a number of factors that contributed to Botswana's achievement here. Um, we've listed some of them on the left, but these factors are also going to be key in allowing other countries to achieve this milestone. For adult prevention, oral PrEP remains a highly effective HIV prevention method, which has seen increasing adoption across countries. As of Q3 2022, there have been approximately 2.8 million cumulative oral PrEP initiations. And we can see this drastic growth in the bottom left, which shows cumulative oral PrEP initiations in LMICs, with the five largest countries specifically called out. And in these five countries in particular, there was enormous growth, both in the number of facilities offering PrEP and correspondingly, the number of oral PrEP initiations. And the same trend is seen from data in 21 PEPFAR-supported countries on the right side of the slide, where there was 157% increase in oral PrEP initiations. So really encouraging to see uptake of this product continue to pick up speed. New research has also shown that many oral PrEP users do not take it continuously, starting and stopping to align with periods of risk. So starting with the left side of the slide, results from a meta-analysis recently found that 41% of oral PrEP users discontinued use within six months. However, of those that discontinued, almost half restarted it within a year, which reaffirms this notion of risk-informed PrEP use. And if we look on the right side of the slide, we can see that even this non-continuous use is still associated with reductions in HIV incidence. So for example, in the search study, there was 74% lower HIV incidence in those who ever initiated oral PrEP compared to no PrEP suggesting effectiveness of this non-continual use. Um, similar results were found in a cost-effectiveness cost modeling study. Um, and that study also found that oral PrEP was cost-effective in 71% of all settings. So this body of research continues to support the effectiveness of oral PrEP use for the reduction of HIV transmission. Another highly cost-effective intervention that reduces the risk of HIV infection is voluntary medical male circumcision, or VMMC. And the number of VMMCs performed is beginning to rebound following significant COVID disruptions, but further adaptations to service delivery are needed to reach pre-pandemic levels. So if we look at the example of Zimbabwe on the left side of the slide, we can see the significant decrease in the number of circumcisions performed in 2020, achieving only 20% of the annual target. Um, but these volumes did begin to rebound in 2021, achieving 83% of the target, but still not reaching pre-pandemic levels. And we've highlighted on the right side some of the enabling factors for Zimbabwe that allowed them to come closer to achieving their 2021 targets. Sustainability is also a large focus for VMMC programs as well as HIV programs generally. And on this slide, we've highlighted some global and national guidance and tools that have been developed to facilitate this process. Uh, and then on the right, we've also included some illustrated illustrative VMMC sustainability enablers as an example, although the tools and guidance I just mentioned apply to programs broadly. Another prevention product I want to mention is the Depivirine Vaginal Ring. However, this product has experienced some regulatory challenges, and in December 2021, the International Partnership for Microbicides voluntarily withdrew its USFD application for the DVR. This decision was based on feedback that approval was unlikely 
based on current data and given the context of the HIV prevention landscape for women in the US. The WHO does conditionally recommend the ring alongside oral prep as a choice for women who do not want or are unable to take a daily oral tablet. Now, in addition to these regulatory hurdles, user preference will also play a role in, a, in adoption. And a number of studies have begun looking at which products might be preferred. So on the right side of the slide, we've highlighted a discrete choice experiment from Namibia that investigated the preferred prep method among adolescent girls and young women. And this study found that about half of adolescent girls and young women preferred Cabalet, with around 10% preferring the ring. So as more prevention options become available, choice will play an increasing role in product selection. And then finally, I'll quickly highlight a couple pipeline prevention products, starting with the left side of the slide. As Amy mentioned in the adult section, lenacapavir is a capsid inhibitor under investigation as a twice annual subcutaneous injectable for HIV prep. And in May 2022, the US FDA lifted the clinical hold on lenacapavir for treatment and prevention, and now all activity can resume. Looking at the right side of the slide, is Latrovir is an investigational NR TTI that was under evaluation in oral and implant formulations for PrEP. However, in December of 2021, the US FDA placed a full or partial clinical hold on all his Latrovir trials. And unfortunately, in September of 2022, Merck discontinued development of monthly oral Islatrovir for PrEP. Another pipeline product we want to highlight is the dual prevention pill, or the DPP, to prevent HIV infection in unplanned pregnancy, which is under development by Viatris. Currently, bioequivalent studies are ongoing, and US FDA submission is expected for late 2023 based on current timelines. And Chai, along with other partners, is currently engaged in advanced planning for the introduction of the DPP. And finally, an mRNA HIV vaccine to prevent HIV acquisition is also under development. And in May of 2022, IAVI and Moderna announced the start of participant screening for this clinical trial, which will be conducted in Rwanda in South Africa, making it the first mRNA HIV vaccine to take place in Africa. So a number of exciting developments with these products providing an opportunity for transformational change, but they will require continued support and efforts from the global community in order to realize progress towards reducing HIV infections. So that concludes today's presentation. I'd like to acknowledge our funders for supporting our work in the HIV space, and also a large thanks to everyone for joining us for today's presentation. We'll now open it up for questions. Let's see, I do think we have one question come through on how countries should start thinking about PEDS ALD introduction. Um, Amy, I'm gonna go ahead and pass this over to you to respond. Yeah, thanks. Um, so until uh, this product is available, um, countries should continue optimizing PEDS DTG. Um, including not refining viral load and accepting that there may be wastage of lopinavir Um, Over the next six months, we advise countries perhaps to think um, as quantifications are happening um, about how pediatric ALD might fit in when they're placing their orders so that we ensure there aren't additional wastage of ABC3TC or PSDTG. Great, thanks so much. And it looks like we have actually a, a follow-up question here on do we know if there is a pricing estimate for generic PEDS ALD or maybe an idea of when a price point would be known? Um, Amy, could you speak to this one as well, please? Sure. Um, so at this time, pricing is unclear, but uh, Chai is working with manufacturers um, to come up with a price that is reasonable and affordable, um, and we will share more information when we know. Great. Thanks so much. Um, again, everyone, feel free to pop questions in the Q&A um, as you have them. Um, thanks to those who have submitted already. It looks like we have one more question here on how countries should be planning for darunavir ritonavir introduction in the absence of a WHO change of status or US FDA generic approval. So I can go ahead and take this one. Um, and the first thing that we want to note here is that Darunavir's alternative status is not because of its efficacy, 
Darunavir ritonavir is more efficacious and tolerable than lopinavir ritonavir, and it's more tolerable than atazanavir ritonavir. Um, additionally, even though darunavir ritonavir does not have US FDA approval and thus can't be procured by PEPFAR, PEPFAR has been very strong in support of this product, saying in their COP guidance that it's preferred for patients failing or unable to take TLD, um, provided that darunavir is available at an affordable price. So with this in mind, and given it has WHO prequalification, country programs should use global fund or domestic funding to purchase darunavir ritonavir. And it is currently available on the Global Fund's Wombo platform for ordering. So given the cost, efficacy, tolerability, and pill burden benefits over lopinavir ritonavir, um, people living with HIV on lopinavir ritonavir could be a good initial population to consider for darunavir introduction. Um, and if you are considering adoption of this product, you can also find further resources on our new product introduction toolkit. Um, I'm going to go ahead and see if we have any other questions. It looks like we do not, um, in which case we can go ahead and conclude today's presentation and call. Thanks again, everyone, for joining today and hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.